um, um, Elias Suskin, who has been uh, uh, a fan of mine for almost 13 years. <laughs> and he, he has insisted, is that okay? Uh, you can hear me, that's the important thing. And Elias Suskin, who is uh, a man of, of great knowledge, a uh, young man of great knowledge, has promised to keep his introduction down to 30 seconds. <laughs> okay. Welcome and thank you for coming to a university bookstore. Um, the bookstore closes at 8, but you can stay for as long as this book signing thing lasts. And uh, could you please, and you need to buy your book before the store closes. Yeah. And this is my grandfather, and he wrote a book about the Beatles. In 1964, he traveled with all four Beatles as a ghost writer for, and a reporter for, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, now, I'm just, uh, I, it, it, also, Elias is my technical advisor here, so you can sit there until I'm ready to, to get the pictures done, so relax there. Thank you very much. Thank you for your, thank you for that. Hi, how are you doing? Um, I think you can all hear me, and if you can't, raise your hand. Michael, you're at the back if you can hear me. So, I want to say it's great, it's great to be here, and, um, to see so many friendly faces, um, including my grandchildren, who you've met Elias, and there's Sadie Suskin, uh, who is dressed up in some kind of garb, I don't know what that's all about. <laughs> and um, with, with friends from pancreatic cancer, which is a, a, a cause near and dear to our hearts, um, raising funds for pancreatic cancer. Scotty and his wife Vicky and... <coughs> Anne and, and Michael, thanks for coming, Michael. Lucky I, I attacked you in the gym today and forced you to come. Um, before I begin to tell you about my adventures with the lads from Liverpool, um, I should mention that I'm, I'm somewhat in shock today. Um, I don't know if there's any child psychologist in the audience, but I know that Dr. David Suskin is a pediatric specialist, so I might ask you for some explanation, but today I went to Lincoln School and noticed hundreds of children behaving in a very disturbing manner. Uh, first of all, most of them, their hair had turned green. <laughs> uh, and they wore t-shirts with names like Hoska and Wilson on the back. <laughs> And that, apparently that wasn't their names. I asked them, are you Hoshka and are you Wilson? And they denied it. Um, and the teachers were dressed in costume appropriate for a New Orleans Mardi Gras. I mean, this was crazy. I, what's going on? These young innocents were running around muttering and chanting semi-audible words like uh, sea and hawk. <laughs> You remember that? <laughs> now, to my way of thinking, it's reached play proportions, and, um, and I, I worry for their future. <laughs> and then all was explained, of course, apparently, as you know, and I have to tell you, this weekend is a football game taking place with a local team involved, and my knowledge of football, I must admit, is pretty scant. I always felt the American football was like an organized prison riot. <laughs> and you, you didn't really have to watch the game until five minutes from the end for the excitement. Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And also a lot of people watch the game purely for the TV commercial. So, <laughs> anyway, but what do I know? But, uh, which actually takes me finally to what I'm going to talk about, which is August 21st, 1964, which was a date that goes down in history because the Liverpool lads came to Seattle. And I don't know, I mean, you're all too young to remember that. Do, that am I correct? And you remember that? No. Um, and I arrived in, in Seattle with the boys, and a new chapter of rock and roll history began. So, so let me tell you a little bit about it. Now, my book, The Beatles and Me on Tour, which is, uh, you may know, is on sale there. I'm not quite ready. 
um, is very different from other books because 95% of other books written about the Beatles were written by people who never met them. And I did. I hung out with them. I, well, 24 cities, five weeks, and I personally witnessed everything that took place in their private jet. We traveled around in their private jet, in hotel rooms across North America, and at their crazy concerts, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. Because as I say, most of you are too young to have even <laughs> been born when the Beatles were around, right? Anyway, I witnessed the madness in an age when you could get very close to rock stars. Today, if you're a media person and you want to go on a rock tour, you can't get close. There are bodyguards and minders and people that just keep you away. But in those days, you know, the Beatles were my oyster. I went into their... I was living in a, in a hotel room next to their suite. I traveled with them in a limousine. I was, I was in limousine number two. They were in limousine number one. Uh, I traveled on their private jet. When I wanted to ask them something, I actually just walked into their room and asked them something. I mean, you can't do that today. And so let me tell you a little bit more about how I got up close and personal with, with really with the greatest band in rock and roll history. Now, before we go to some of our pictures, I, I, I'm going to answer one question that a lot of people ask me when I do the book tour circuit, and it is basically, why me? How did I happen to get on this gig? And I wish I could say that I was a brilliant rock and roll writer and I knew music inside out, but the truth was, I didn't. I had never been to a single Beatle concert until the Beatles came along. I was dead lucky. I was a foreign correspondent in Los Angeles when my editor called me from London and said, the Beatles are coming to America, travel with them, eat with them, drink with them, sleep with them if you have to. I wasn't of that inclination, but I got the message. Mm -hmm. And there it was, five weeks of close encounters with the Beatle kind. And it was quite, quite amazing that I was able to go on that tour. And the tour, the tour started in San Francisco. And I showed up in San Francisco trying to get into the Hilton Hotel and there were thousands of girls outside mm -hmm. and I fought my way through there I said I'd like my room and they said we're sold out and I said I'm with the Beatles and they said come on then and I'm with the Beatles was a magic passport to Beatledom and I enjoyed it for the next five or six weeks but as I say it was a dream assignment but who knew who knew 50 years from now we'd be sitting in Seattle talking about the Beatles, because the Beatles are bigger than ever. I mean, Sadie here, don't you sing the Beatles songs before you go to bed? No. I guess that was a no, was it? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, yes, thank you very much. Okay, so, so what, I, what I'm going to do with the, with the able assistance of my, my technical assistant here, um, I will show you a few pictures from the trip, and with the pictures comes a, an interesting memory and an inter interesting story, and then once I've meandered on for about three and a half hours, <laughs> I'll, 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 uh, you, you may have a few questions. So, uh, Maestro, could you hit uh, picture number one? Okay, here we are. Look, Seattle. Wow, what a day. Now, we showed up in Seattle, and we stayed at a hotel called the Edgewater Inn. I mean, you probably know it, don't you? And it was, it was called the Edgewater Inn because I think it was at the edge of the water. <laughs> And the Beatles were trapped. They couldn't go anywhere. There were a lot of girls hanging around the hotel. You, do you remember that? I remember the story of them fishing out the window. Yes. I was just, oh, you just took it away from oh. me. <laughs> Indeed, that's what happened. We decided to get fishing rods, and the Beatles fished out the window of their hotel, and uh, they didn't catch anything. <laughs> you know, I think they didn't have any bait. They didn't have a safety pin, but it was a good photo op. And this was what it was all about, photo ops, press conferences, because the Beatles, I should go back a little bit and say, in 1964 in February, Brian Epstein wanted to take the Beatles to America, but he didn't know whether the, America was ready for the Beatles. So he put them on the Ed Sullivan Show. And I apologize if you've seen this before, but Ed Sullivan was the guy who ran this variety show. Now he was a bit stiff and wooden and he would have made a good traffic cop because this is what he did when he introduced everybody, Mike, didn't he? Did you ever remember Ed Sullivan? 
Oh, okay. <laughs> well, he did. He was, he was a bit wooden. And those of you who remember, he introduced the Beatles and there were 74 million people that tuned in wow. that night. And when they tuned in to that night, then they tuned in to another night a week later and they recorded the third program, Brian Epstein said, the country is ready for the Beatles. Mm -hmm. Now, so off we came, San Francisco, Las Vegas and Seattle. Now, what happened in Seattle happened in other cities. I showed up there. Uh, a, a young woman banged at my hotel door on the same floor as the Beatles and she said um, I'm Ringo's sister and I said Ringo doesn't have a sister she ran screaming off <laughs> and in other cities in other cities I, I'd go into a hotel room and there were three girls in my closet they were too young to be the maids I knew something was afoot and they thought well maybe if they hung out in my room it may be the Beatles room. And that was the kind of thing that went on. The young women, 14, 15, 16, wanted to hold the Beatles' hands. And sometimes it was difficult, and sometimes they came up with strange tricks to get in there. Uh, uh, three girls hid in, in a room service cart, mm -hmm. and when it was wheeled into the Beatles' room, they jumped out. Uh, <laughs> they were pinned down, they were arrested, they were <laughs> maced. No, they weren't. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, that was the crowd in Seattle. What a, and that was the way it was everywhere. Seattle, I mean, there was a sellout. And the trouble was that at every concert, you couldn't hear a word of, of them singing. And why do you think you couldn't hear a word? Screaming. 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 I mean, um, you weren't a screamer back in those days, were you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I still sing their songs at night. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so so there there they were, screaming from start to finish. And you know, it took me. I mean, it was after 15 years I finally realised what the Beatles were singing about because I could never hear a word. I sat in the front row, like in that seat, and as soon as the Beatles started singing, the screaming began. And it never stopped until the end. And a question I like to ask, talk about the concerts in every single city, is, now if you know the answer to this, let me know. Well, how long do you think the Beatles performed for, for a concert? Any guesses? How long? 30 minutes. Good. Anybody else? An hour. An hour. Okay. The answer is... 29 minutes, <laughs> 28 minutes, because the Beatles like to race through their songs and they like to break their world record. And once they came off and said, we did it in 27 minutes or 13 seconds. <laughs> 10 songs, wow. 10 songs, no chit chat, no in between, uh -huh. no dialogue. The only dialogue was when they said, and here's a song from my, our latest movie, Hard Day's Night. And that was it, that was the, the, the gist of their conversation. And the interesting thing was back then, and again, it's a, it's a fascinating thought. What do you think the cost of the top ticket was <laughs> at the Beatles concert in 1964? Five bucks. Five. Eight dollars. Five dollars, you're right. Five, yeah. Were you there? You weren't there. <laughs> okay, and I always say this. A lady came to me at the Beatles convention in Los Angeles and said, I am a fan of Paul McCartney. I go to every concert. And I get a front row seat and I pay $2,500 for one ticket. Mm -hmm. I mean, Good Lord. a bit crazy, but there it is. $5, $2,500. But of course, Paul McCartney sings for three hours. And the Beatles, 28, 27 <laughs> minutes. But as soon as the Beatles finished, we'll, we'll get to the next picture in a minute. As soon as the Beatles finished, they were gone. They were gone girl, as we used to say about that movie, which is actually quite good if any of you saw that movie, Gone Girl. Anybody see it? Quite good. A good book as well. So they were gone. They were in their limo, and they were out the building before you could say, Elvis has left the building. And I was in the second limousine, and sometimes, because the limousines were being attacked by, you know, 300 or 200 or 100 screaming teenagers and if you've ever been attacked by that you know how dangerous that is I mean you know it's life and limb and they would attack them the, the, the limousine seriously and the Beatles then escaped in an armored truck in, uh, in a meat truck 
and in an ambulance because once the ambulance put its red light on and went out nobody would stop them so they got away I on the other hand were trapped in, be in limo number two <laughs> and the story I tell happened in um, I think it was Philadelphia or Cleveland I can't remember was suddenly the Beatles had gone in an ambulance and I was in number two and the, and the girls came hammering at my window a rather frosted window and it couldn't quite see through and as I say do I look like a beetle? <laughs> I mean, look at my hair. And look at my beard. I mean, come on. <laughs> so, no, the answer was, I was scared. The girls couldn't care less. They couldn't see. They were hammering away. And they, and they shook. I mean, a hundred girls like zombies, you know, on your, <laughs> on your bumper. It's kind of dangerous, you know. And I always say the story, and it was true. I, I had this horrible feeling that one day... My parents in London would get a message to say, Mrs. Davis, your your son, unfortunately, was crushed to death by Beatle fans. <laughs> Thank heavens it never happened. <laughs> so, we're going to move on to the next picture, sir. Okay, now which one is the Beatle and which one is... <laughs> that was in the day when I used to smoke cigarillos and George smoked a lot of cigarettes. The Beatles were smoking cigarettes, all fags they called them, ciggies. And the other thing was that I was on the journey with George to write George's column. I was George's ghostwriter. And what happened was that the newspaper I worked for, the London Daily Express, big circulation paper, four million copies a day. I mean, that was, that was big, big readership. I had hired George to write a column except he was a guitarist, and who, who do you think wrote the column? I did. But the problem was that George was supposed to sit down with me after every concert and tell me his feelings, his deeper thoughts, his innermost whatever. But he never went to bed till 3 a.m. He never woke until 3 p.m. And as a result, I, had a, I couldn't talk to him. And my deadline was three hours earlier, so I... Keep this to yourself. Made it up. <laughs> For two columns, I made it up. And then on the third week, George came to me and said, Ivor, somebody called me from London and said, the column under my name is a bunch of old shite. <laughs> I knew what he meant. Yes. I knew what he meant. So I said, George, if you woke up and told me what was going on in your heart and I could write a brilliant column under your name, it would work. And he did wake up. And he did talk to me, and the column improved, and our relationship improved enormously. So that was me and George, the ghostwriter. And the interesting thing about George was, he was the most... He was a quiet... They call him the quiet Beatle, if you remember. And he was fairly quiet. He was a bit uncomfortable <laughs> being a Beatle, and he wanted, like many young musicians... And he was the youngest Beatle of the lot. He was 21 at the time. Mm. And the, Beatles, the other Beatles were aged 22 and 23. Mm. And I was the old man of the group. 24. So, you know, you can imagine, I, was, I knew it all. But, so George was a young guy who wanted to be a star in his own right, and he wasn't comfortable with the Beatles, and he became more comfortable with, it, with himself when he left the Beatles and then started writing his own music, some of the great music, some of the, and he went out on his own like all the rest of the Beatles did. They showed that they were, they were talented in their own right, as well as them. Uh, Mr. Suskin, please. Yeah. Okay, so now here we are backstage in Cleveland and something happened in Cleveland that never happened ever on a Beatle trip. The girls came charging up in Cleveland to the stage. The police panicked and they ordered the safety curtain to come down and they ordered the concert to be stopped dead in its tracks after about 15 to 20 minutes. Now, the police got on and said to John... This is over, go back to the dressing room. John argued with the police, and so did George, and they all were very upset. But they went to their dressing room, and finally, rather than cancel the concert, Derek Taylor, who was a brilliant Liverpool guy, a journalist, who was the press secretary for the Beatles, he was the guy that, that helped me on my, on, my, on my travels with the Beatles, Derek Taylor stood up with a microphone and said to the audience, you have, this is your last chance. You must stay in your seats. You must promise to stay in your seats. Otherwise, it's all over. So everybody sat down. They put the curtain up. The Beatles were called back on stage. And this never happened 
in 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 all their concerts, and the and the concert was finished in Cleveland after it almost got cancelled. So that was the only time it came close to ending. Okay, as I mentioned to you, you heard my limousine story. I survived. I'm still here, but. The Beatles travelled everywhere in limos, but we also travelled in a private jet. And the private jet was terrific. There was just me, the Beatles, some radio guys, and the backup groups. Now the backup groups, would you believe, opened the concert for the Beatles. There were, there were some people, there was a group called the Righteous Brothers. Remember them? And there was a lady called Jackie DeShannon. Also, she's still around. She's actually, she was, she was a beautiful blonde singer. But, you know, nobody cared less. You know, you could have had the Queen of England sing Royal Britannia. <laughs> they, would have, they would have screamed. They would, all they wanted was the Beatles. And the Righteous Brothers finally told me that, I knew what, I knew what happened. Halfway through the tour, the Righteous Brothers went to Brian Epstein and said, look, let us out of our contract. And, and, and the final straw that broke the Righteous Brothers back was in New York City, the Beatles came in for their, to do their act in a helicopter. And the helicopter hovered over the stage as the Righteous Brothers played. Oh, yeah. oh, my. Yeah. So nobody could hear the, <laughs> the music. And then finally, the Righteous Brothers, who were being paid probably about 450 bucks you know, a week <laughs> where they could have got 500 a night elsewhere, finally said to Brian, please, enough already. But nobody wanted it. I mean, it was, it was just the Beatles that people came to see. And in fact, you know, the Beatles themselves never knew what was happening to them. I mean, I, I know this sounds ridiculous because, because I always say that when at the end of the tour, which was a huge success, I mean, they, they made a million bucks, which is quite big money back then, and then they never thought they would be around today and we would be sitting in, in Seattle talking about them. I mean, they said, I mean, I always say this, that when, when, the, when the concert finished and uh, Ringo uh, was looking pretty exhausted, I said, uh, everything all right, Ringo? Yeah. I said, now you've made a few shillings on this tour. What do you want to do with your money? And his ambition was to open a ladies' hairdressing salon. <laughs> I mean, that was the big time. That was really... And uh, Paul just said, I'm going to write music for other people. So they never knew uh, that the, you know, the longevity would, would last. I mean, the Stones have kept going, and the Beatles have kept going, and um, there's not all that many that... I mean, the Beatles are so super, to even today, bigger today almost than they were then. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. Next picture, please. Okay. So here's what happened. We were in Las Vegas, and um, the Beatles wanted to go into the casino just to walk around, but the security at the Sahara Hotel said, no way. I mean, it's, it's too dangerous. You could get torn limb from limb, and they could have got torn limb from limb. Uh, and it was injurious to their health to leave the hotel room. So... What the hotel people did, because Vegas was Vegas and gambling was gambling, is they hauled these fruit machines up to their room for another picture opportunity. I mean, they didn't put them. So there we are, have the boys playing with that. And, and John, being a kind of wicked sense of humor guy, said to the manager of the hotel, gambling is evil. <laughs> Which didn't go down too well. <laughs> So there he was taking pictures and he was telling the media gambling is evil. So, but, but that was John. I mean, he had a, a, a sort of a savage, savage sense of humor. So the Beatles were stuck in Vegas in their hotel room. And the, when they were stuck in their hotel room, nobody else, I mean, a lot of people wanted to come and see them. But that's why I got the opportunity to hang out with them because they, they were stuck with me. <laughs> and uh, and so John would call at three o'clock in the morning and say we're playing Monopoly, come over. And I always like to tell that the Monopoly, which which uh, I don't think too many people play it today. But anyway, that John was a terrible cheat at Monopoly. <laughs> <laughs> now how do you, how do you cheat at Monopoly? I'll tell you how. 
you want to land on a, 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 an expensive property, you roll the dice, the number does not come up, John rolls again. <laughs> and then he rolls again, and he finally keeps rolling until he lands on the property. And that was, that was John. But it was fun, he was bored, he played Monopoly with me, and then I got my own back on him because I played poker with him. I'm a terrible poker player, he is an atrocious, or was, and I used to win a few shillings from him that, that, that kept me in, uh, in uh, gambling chips. Anyway, so that was, that was Las Vegas for you, and then we're moving along to... <laughs> okay, now, the interesting thing about that is this is a Hollywood garden party, okay? Now... Alan Livingston, the head of Capitol Records, which was the Beatles record sleeve ca cover, uh, decided that he would put on a garden party for charity for the Haemophiliac Foundation. And so what he did was he invited people, I think about a hundred bucks, and they had to bring their children or grandchildren, the stars. Mm -hmm. And it was remarkable because, because it was either Beatles give a concert for charity or the Beatles sit on those high chairs in the garden in, in, in Hollywood and meet the stars as they came in. I mean, everybody came in. Edward G. Robinson, Lloyd Bridges, uh, Shirley Temple. I mean, some of the biggest stars brought their kids along to meet. Rita Hayworth was there with her kids. Mm -hmm. And the Beatles sat there for an hour meeting the movie stars and posing for pictures. And there was a... There was a I always remember there was a... Um, Hedda Hopper was a famous... Hollywood columnist of the era who wore hats. outrageous mm -hmm. hats, right? And uh, and John turned to me and said, "Who's the old bird in the funny hat?" <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "She's a Hollywood columnist." But then he posed the pictures, and she was the queen of Hollywood. So the Beatles went along with her. So that was an example of the Beatles meeting movie stars. And they did it rather well, and at the end of it, I said to Paul, it wasn't too bad, and he said it would have been easier to do a concert. Oh. Yeah. So I guess, you know, it was a bit, it was an hour and a half, and they only entertained for 30 minutes, so they, so you can see why he felt concerts would have, been, would have been easier. But I'll tell you a funny story. I mean, in Hollywood, the movie stars wanted to hook up with the Beatles. They wanted picture opportunities, they wanted to use the Beatles' magic for them. And the Beatles were very wary of this. The Beatles liked Bob Dylan. They liked uh, Joan Baez, who was his girlfriend at the time. They actually got together eventually with Elvis Presley, but that's another story. So they did like a few, a few people. But one day, um, there was a, a, an actress of... Um, how shall I put it? Her name was Mamie Van Doren. Mm -hmm. And um, she actually enticed them to come to a nightclub and to be honest with you um, the Beatles were very unhappy they went to the nightclub with her they got a bit drunk and uh, the photographers were sticking cameras up their noses and taking pictures and George got finally very drunk he said to the photographer would you kindly leave sir he actually didn't quite use that phrase <laughs> <laughs> uh, stronger language uh, as children are present I shall keep my voice down <laughs> The photographer insisted, ignored him, stuck the camera up his nose, flashed the, flashed the camera. In those days, there were big cameras with little flash bulbs that blinded you. Um, George threw his drink at the photographer. It missed the photographer. Now, um, I, I slightly screwed up this story because I should say that the woman that enticed them to the Whiskey A Go Go nightclub was Jane Mansfield. Uh, who was uh, who was a second, uh, not Mamie Van Doren, but she comes into the story. Mm -hmm. So Jane Mansfield was there, canoodling with the Beatles. George threw the drink at the photographer, missed the photographer. It, f it fell all over Mamie Van Doren, mm -hmm. who was another voluptuous, if, I don't mind, if you don't mind me using that phrase in this sexist, uh, uh, anti-sexist period, voluptuous lady, and uh, she was very upset. There was a screaming, and the Beatles were rushed out. <laughs> And the next day, a front-page picture of George throwing the drink oh, appeared on the front page of the Herald Examiner. And George, in the plane, as we were leaving L.A., said, this is what happens when you are enticed by voluptuous women. <laughs> <laughs> and we all know what happens, uh, us gentlemen here. We know we try and avoid voluptuous women. 
<laughs> Isn't that right, Mike? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Now, um, the Beatles had a little bit of time off and they went uh, for a weekend with Brian during his, uh, he had his birthday. Now, Brian Epstein was the brilliant guy who actually turned the Beatles from a kind of a, you know, when they started out and when they were playing Hamburg and the Red Light District and the strip clubs, they were greasy and they had leather jackets and they would, they would smoke and they would make rude jokes and they would turn their backs on the audience. Brian got them together, said, I'm going to sign you. And he didn't say, I'm going to clean you up, but he, that, he knew that was going to be the, the way to do it. So he got them to wear tires. He got them to wear those very narrow suits. Remember those suits and, 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 and trousers? The suits were so narrow, they didn't have pockets. You know, they were tailored by a, a Carnaby Street tailor for the Beatles. And he cleaned them up. And, he, and of course, they all had the same haircut. And so that was the difference. Brian, and also he made them bow. Remember that little half bow? Mm -hmm. And, and that, was the, that was the appeal of, of America. I mean, if you were sending your kids to see the Beatles play and you got a ticket to a concert in America on that concert tour, uh, parents were fairly happy and safe to let their kids go and see the Beatles perform. Because I always tell this story that somebody in New York said to me, what's the difference between the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, because the Rolling Stones were very big at that time. And somebody else said, well, the difference is that the Beatles are kind of clean-cut guys who want to hold your hand. He said, but the Rolling Stones want to burn your town down. <laughs> and it was, if you remember, the Rolling Stones were the bad boys, weren't they? The bad boys of... But Brian Epstein, back to Brian Epstein. So he brilliantly turned them into very commercial properties. The only thing, and I'll tell you this, the only thing that he, he goofed on was on merchandising. Now, let me tell you, merchandising today, I mean, what's this team? Is, is it the Sounders are playing on Sunday or is it the Mariners? What? The Seahawks. What? Seahawks, yeah. yeah. Uh, look at the merchandising for the Seahawks, right? I mean, my God, I mean, Re Rebecca went out the other day and we wanted to buy a shirt and was told it was $750? $75, sorry. Merchandising is big bucks, but back then it wasn't. And when Brian Epstein was approached by somebody and they said, they're going to America, they're going to do a tour, you should have somebody handling merchandising, Brian said, oh, okay, didn't know much about it. He turned to his high-priced lawyer and said, would you handle it? The lawyer, who represented Judy Garland and some of the big stars, thought, uh, this is beneath me, get someone else. So Brian hired a guy from London who went to New York, opened a company called Seal Tab, which is Beatles spelled backwards, to run the merchandising. And what, what this guy did was, he came to Brian the next day and he said, uh, Brian, here's a letter of agreement um, to sign for merchandising. And he put down merchandising company 90%, Beatles 10%. Oh, oh no. Do you know what? Brian signed it. Seriously. And then several weeks later, Brian shows up in New York and this guy shows up to him, with him and says, Brian, here's your check, the first check in the merchandising. And Brian looks at it and says, $9,000. Wow, how much of this do I owe you? And the guy said, no, this is your 10%. <laughs> and Brian realized he had goofed. He'd given it away. And, of course, the Beatles were very upset about uh, merchandising. And I always remember the story when I, was, I wish I'd kept it, but I went to uh, one of the concerts. I bought a 75-cent Beatle wig. I was so proud of it. I came up to John and said, John, in his hotel room, John, look at this wig. He looked at it with disgust went to the window and threw it out. <laughs> and, and he never gave me the 75 cents back. <laughs> Disgusting, I know. <laughs> okay, now, I was going to say, can you pick me out of that crowd? Oh! oh. <laughs> but that, that was everybody. The photographers, the, the Righteous Brothers, my, uh, all the Beatles, uh, the, the Exciters, the, the, the Righteous Brothers, and... and, and um, Where's Jackie DeShannon? There's Jackie DeShannon, a little blonde in the back there. Yeah, and that's Jackie DeShannon. Right, thank you. And that was our, that was the only picture, the only group picture we ever took. You know, I mean, it, and it's quite a, 
And I've got it in my living room on the wall, and every time my daughter comes, she says, Dad, get that one down, right? <laughs> anyway, so that was, that was the whole traveling group. Photographers, radio guys, um, road managers. And I, I'll tell you about the road managers. Before you, uh, let me just walk What's around here. Road managers, Grandpa? Sorry, I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> Which one's the road managers? I've got, I've got, so the road managers are two interesting guys. Neil Aspinall, there, mm -hmm. and Malcolm Evans, there. Now, can you believe this? 26 concerts, 20, 35 days, and they had two road managers. I mean, you look at Paul McCartney today, he's got, he's got an army load of trucks and this and that. Two guys carried the sound system <laughs> and, <laughs> and did everything else. Mm -hmm. And and plug plug the uh, plug everything in. I'm just trying to get through here without <coughs> on my knees. It's the first audience I've been on my knees to. <laughs> here we go. And oops. Okay, sorry about that. That wasn't me. I apologise for that, but that's it. So, so thank you. That's fine. Thanks. So, I mean that that was it. I mean, I mean the you know the, the road managers had this primitive sound system because most of the stadiums they played at could not, didn't, were set up for circuses and rodeos and cattle shows, mm -hmm. not for rock and roll. Mm -hmm. The sound systems were appalling. I mean, look at it today now, it's, it's quite brilliant. It has to be brilliant. But then it was awful and those two guys mm -hmm. that I talked to you about, Mal, Big Mal on the, in the back and Neil there, were, the, were the, the faithful, loyal roadies. Neil went on to become head of Apple Records. Oh. And Mal, unfortunately, came to L.A., got onto drugs, mm. and was shot dead by the Los Angeles Sheriff's Office mm. in a drug deal or a drug mm. incident. Mm. Thank you. Next picture, sir. Next picture. Okay. We're almost there. <laughs> These are the boys... On their way out. Now, my editor in London said to me, is George having a stroke? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, that's the way he smiled. <laughs> and, you know, I, I didn't know until... George didn't smile that much. And the reason he didn't smile that much was he didn't have very good teeth. Seriously. I mean, I know this sounds kind of crazy, but in England in those days, they didn't... You know, dental work wasn't uh, a necessity. And so George kind of kept his mouth shut, and, and because he kept his mouth shut, they, people thought he was, I don't know, they thought he was the quiet beetle. And that's what, that's what it was. And, and, and let me just tell you, I think I've told you about the way they were. George was a bit sullen, a bit hard to get to know, because I was writing his column, and I told you why. John was absolutely quixotic, brilliant, funny, socially conscious, I mean, he was worried about, he wanted to go and see where John Kennedy would be, was shot in Dallas, and Brian Epstein thought it would be too raw, because, the, you know, John Kennedy, November 19, November 1963, Beatles less than a year later in Dallas. So, John was funny, witty, he could impersonate, and, and he was the funnest guy to be with. Paul was, Paul was always a very clever guy, and he finally, as you know, became the richest Beatle and probably one of the richest rock and roll people on the face of the earth. Because what he did was he married Linda Eastman, who was a photographer, and then Linda's brother and Linda's father were New York lawyers and they got Paul, they got Paul in order. They told him to buy his music, to protect himself, and so that's why Paul is such a, such a wealthy guy today. And he's still performing, and he's performing for three hours. I don't know, did somebody here say they went to a Paul concert? I saw him a few years. You did, okay. And how long did, he, how long did he sing for? It was a couple, two and a half hours. Yeah. 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 And it was, it, it, it was terrific, wasn't oh, it? It was great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then I always talk about Ringo. Ringo was, a, you know, was a drummer, and, you know, drummers drum. They don't, they're not really great conversationalists. <laughs> and, um, you know... Ringo was a, was, a, was a nice kid on the can. In, you know, they all were kids in the candy store in America. Oh, they just swept through America. They loved it. Ringo loved it even more. And believe it or not, at the end of the tour, 
Ringo was the most popular. Mm-hmm. And, and, the, and a question I like to ask is, they made their movie, A Hard Day's Night, and who came out of it looking like the biggest star? Mm-hmm. Ringo. Yeah. And then in the second film, he was also big. So Ringo did well, even though he was a drummer. <laughs> okay. Um, it was great fun. And uh, before I take a few questions, before you all fall asleep, I, the, the thing I say this, and I finish, usually, I think we finished the pictures, have we not? No, no, no. Yeah, we finished the pictures. <laughs> Thank you. Um, is my only regret on the whole tour and I wish I'd done this, was that I never took my iPhone camera with me. Oh. <laughs> if I'd done that, I'd had all the pictures to show you of me and the Beatles cavorting. Oh. But there it is. You can't be brilliant all the time. So, any questions? Thank you very much. <laughs>